shadow of the conquering German armies covered Western Europe, the self-styled master race was riding high. Adolf Hitler stood just as Napoleon had stood more than a hundred years before and looked across the English Channel to the one fighting obstacle that stood between him and world domination. The chalk cliffs of Britain rose sheer and white out of the choppy waters. And beyond, a little island, smaller than the state of Wyoming, Crush that little island and its stubborn people, and the way was open for world conquest. The fall of Austria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Denmark, Norway, Holland, Belgium, France had given him more than 100 million slaves to work for him or starve. The preliminaries were over. It was time for the main event, the Battle of Britain. Hitler and his generals feverishly drafted their plans for the conquest of Britain. Every detail must be anticipated. A slip now might wreck the whole timetable of world conquest. Six weeks of final preparation went into those plans. Six weeks to determine the history of a thousand years. The thing was foolproof. See for yourselves how simple the whole operation was to be. Look. German plan for invasion of England. Phase one. Knock out the Royal Air Force and its bases. Get control of the air and the sea lanes across the channel. Follow the Blitz plan that had wiped out Poland, the Low Countries, and France. Destroy communication and transport lines. Above all, get command of the air. Phase two. Pulverize the coastline with dive bombers. Drop parachute troops to take over the airfields and establish beachheads. Phase three, actual invasion. Pour the German panzer divisions across in high-speed barges under an umbrella protecting fighter planes. Then send spearheads of armed might to divide, surround, destroy all opposition. That's all there was to it. Conquer Britain. Force the surrender of the British fleet. Then, with the combined sea power of Germany, Britain, Italy, France, and Japan, he could control the seas and tell us where to head in. The torch of freedom flickered low. On the Channel Invasion coasts, more than a hundred fully equipped German divisions were singing the Nazi theme song, We Are Sailing Against England, as they waited the word from Hitler. Here, for weeks, all the supplies and weapons of the Nazi war machine had been turned toward Britain. The jaws 
jaws of the Nazi whale were set to swallow Jonah. And what about Jonah? How was he doing? Well, Britain also had an army, but it was an army dragged from the sea at Dunkirk. without weapons. These had been left behind on the roads of France. Tanks, guns, motorized equipment, all abandoned to save the one priceless item, men. In all of Britain, there was not enough equipment for one modern division. Only one tank for every thousand square miles of territory. Only one machine gun for every 1,500 yards of beach. Britain had a navy too, but it was scattered all over the globe, guarding vital food and supply lines. And the British knew it would be suicide to use their fleet in the narrow waters of the English Channel with the German Air Force in control of the air. Britain also had an air force. An air force outnumbered 10 to 1 by the enemy, both in men and machines. And then there was Britain herself, the people of Britain, the people who were to be terrorized and forced to surrender. They knew that every man, woman, and child, in uniform or out, would be Hitler's target in the onslaught that might come at any moment. They knew they had a job to do, and not much time to do it in. The young, the not so young, and the old. The clerk, the butcher, the farmer, the member of parliament, they formed the civilian army, Britain's home guard. They started from scratch. Experience, equipment, supplies, all were scarce. Only one shell to fire at each practice. The women of Britain refused to be left out. We'll enlist too. We'll put up the barrage balloons. Man the ACAC guns. We'll run the railroads and get the trains through on time. Ferry the planes. Carry the dispatches. Drive the ambulances and run the buses. And we'll see that our men are fed and don't go hungry. Others work, men and women alike. They worked full time, overtime, double time, 40 hours a week, 50, 60, 70. Hours meant nothing. Fatigue meant nothing. until the government forced them to cut down hours because over-fatigue was hurting production. And when they weren't working, the men patrolled the moors for parachutists, blocked the roads, rehearsed invasion defenses, For something had happened here the Germans could never understand. In a democracy, it is not the government that makes war. It is the people. To lead them, the people had chosen Winston Churchill as their prime minister. 
And he spoke the words in every British heart when he said, We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on beaches, landing grounds, in fields, in streets, and on the hills. We shall never surrender. This was Britain in its darkest hour. The people knew they were in for the worst the Nazi mind could invent, yet they didn't panic or run away. They patrolled and waited. They drilled and waited. They worked and waited. Waited for the terror they knew was coming. Then it came. That's the sound that became part of the life of every man, woman, and child in Britain. August 8, 1940, and the battle for Britain is on. 30 enemy aircraft over the channel, flying due west. Here comes the Luftwaffe. In dozens of flights, hundreds of planes, bombers, fighters, dive bombers across that 21 miles of channel that eight short minutes of water their first tactics were to bomb convoys in the channel convoys loaded with food and munitions bound for the great port of london Fighters waited overhead for the defending planes of the Royal Air Force, the RAF, to appear. They didn't have long to wait. odds of six, eight, ten to one, and dove in, shouting the old hunting cry, tally-ho! of the Nazi plan called for the RAF to be knocked out of the air. But the men of the RAF hadn't read the Nazi plan. two German planes out of the sky. For the next week, the Germans attacked the coast cities from the Thames River to Weymouth.
Take cover. with 180 more planes. Then the Luftwaffe battered the great port towns of Southampton, Plymouth, trying for a knockout before the flow of supplies from overseas became more than a trickle. The ports took a terrible pounding, but they couldn't be knocked out. Cargoes went on being unloaded with the protection of the RAF overhead. Battling the spitfires and hurricanes in the air wasn't panning out. So Goering switched his main attacks to the fighter airfields, Dover, Deal, Hawking. Maybe he could destroy the planes on the ground. He bombed the airfields, and the fields were hit. But the planes were saved. For Britain, unlike Poland and the Low Countries, didn't make the mistake of bunching its planes on the runways. The planes of the RAF were scattered and hidden, only a few on any one field, and those in the far corners. The Spitfires still went up to meet the enemy. In the first 10 days of the Battle of Britain, Goering launched 26 major attacks to get command of the air, and lost 697 aircraft. The British lost 153, and 60 British pilots bailed out. Valuable trained men were saved and ready to fight again, but the crews of Goering's planes were lost to him forever. The pace was too hot. Something was going haywire. The Nazis had to call time out. On a 2,000 mile front, from Norway to France, the whole Nazi blitz program was being stalled because the RAF was still in the air. The shock troops were getting hoarse from singing, we are sailing against England. The long range German guns were getting hot from throwing shells across the channel. In public, Hitler assured the Germans, Mr. Churchill tells his people that England will win, but I tell you that victory will belong to Germany. But in private, he sent for Goering, the boss of the Luftwaffe, and put him on the hot seat. Goering was told to do something and do it quick. So on August 30th, he ordered all-out attacks on inland airdromes and industrial centers. Maybe he could knock out the RAF on the assembly line. And he adopted new tactics, too. More fighters and fewer bombers. Or maybe he just had fewer bombers to send. Anyway, those he did send were well protected. Fighters above at high altitudes. Fighters on both sides. Fighters in the front and in the rear. Fighters weaving in and out of the bomber formations. Britain, winner of the first round, was ready. With higher morale and sharper defense. Improved listening posts were set up all along the coast and warned of the enemy's approach before he left the continent. A quick flash from the control station to the fighter station. And pilots were on their way to meet the enemy while he was still over the channel. Day after day, out of sight, and almost out of sound of the watchers on the cliffs. Four, five, and six miles above, the battles raged over the Dover area. The 
Dover area became known as Hell's Corner. By sheer weight of numbers, the enemy again and again broke through the coastal defenses. And reached inland to the airdrome. Aircraft plants. Munition factories and machine shops. in the southeast. Right. The workers kept on working, and the RAF kept on flying. These few men with wings alone in the sky, behind their motors and machine guns, were shooting down more than the Luftwaffe. They were smashing the whole Nazi plan of world conquest. Destroyed, but yes. Oh, good show. How'd you get on, sir? Oh, I had a wonderful party, thanks. Are you all right? You get any of the batters? Yes, I got a measurement 109 and a Dornier. Between August 24th and September 5th, 35 major attacks were launched. They cost the Germans 562 planes, while the British lost only 219 planes and saved 132 pilots. Invasion plans were going completely haywire. The Nazis were blind with rage. The German mind has never understood why free people fight on against overwhelming odds. Hitler now knew he was superior in every weapon except the weapon of spirit. So he told Goering, break that spirit, crush the people, crush the spirit of democratic life itself. Invasion now would have to wait. The Nazis would avoid the RAF and smash the great city of London into the rubble heap they had made of Warsaw and Rotterdam. Could London take it? Even the people themselves didn't know the answer. The defenses they trusted in were London's hastily assembled anti-aircraft, the ACAC guns, the balloon barrage which kept the raiders at high altitude. The Royal Air Force, now down to its last reserves. And the plain, downright guts of the people. They sent more children out of the city. Tightened air raid precautions stationed more aeroplane spotters, rehearsed firefighters, moved into bomb shelters. They blacked out their city and carried on. The first blow aimed to crush the British spirit came on September 7th.
Third floor, clear. Second floor, clear. First floor, clear. That day, when 375 German planes came roaring up the Thames River, the Battle of Britain became the Battle of London. The Germans broke through the charge of hurricanes and spitfires that went out to meet them. Gone was any pretense of aiming at military objectives. This was just savage destruction. homes of the East End poor and the Mayfair rich, on shops, hospitals, churches. For 28 days, the Nazis were to drop everything in the book on the city of London. Tons upon tons of high explosives, delayed action bombs that exploded days later, torpedoes that sheared away whole buildings. And underneath the war in the air, the war of the man in the street went on. He learned to exist with very little food. He forgot what it meant to have a night's sleep, spending most of his time underground in the damp and dark and cold. Hello, Mrs. Fox. You're here early tonight. Well, I'm on the safe side, aren't I? I think that'll be all right now. Yes, that's grand. Anyway, I'll be back in a few minutes if you want. Now, how are we going to get you up there? Get a young man to lift you up. Barney? Hello. Come get young lady and lift up. Right, I'm coming. Oh, well. The air raid wardens stayed at their posts. Doctors and nurses worked on steadily as the bombs crashed all around them. Rescue squads labored night and day. Hey, Gordon! The up! Is she dead? Fight, sir. Firemen said, nuts to the bombs and battled to put out fires. This was life in the Blitz. Against all the rules of Nazi warfare, Britain was refusing to crumple up. Across the channel, the enraged Goering took personal command of the operations. And on September 15th, he sent the Luftwaffe into one of its greatest attacks. hundred German bombers and Messerschmitt fighters roared over the English coast. Stormath calling. Planes heard three miles southwest. Shout for hostile planes approaching from the southwest. The British met the challenge by throwing in everything they had. historic three-dimensional battle took place inside an area 60 miles long, 38 broad, and from five to six miles high.
100 individual dogfights took place within the first 30 minutes of the raid. Some of the German bombers broke through London's defences. And reached the centre of the city. hundred German planes that came over that day, more than one-third were shot down. In the 28 days of terror from September 7th to October 5th, the Nazis dropped 50 million pounds of bombs on the city, killed 7,000 helpless civilians, and wounded 10,000 more. Bombs fell on Buckingham Palace. Westminster Abbey, the Houses of Parliament, Fleet Street, the center of the news, St. Paul's Cathedral, bombs blasting the historic past out of the lives of Englishmen. But. In these 28 days, the Nazis lost 900 planes and their crews. The more they sent over, the more were shot down. The British Spitfire had proved to be one of the deadliest weapons ever put in the hands of man. If this kept up, pretty soon no more Luftwaffe. The frantic Nazis had to pull a new one. They did. On October 6th, they changed to night attacks. Maybe that way they could avoid those deadly spitfires and hurricanes. Maybe that way they could crush the stubborn British spirit. Never mind control of the air. Never mind phase one, phase two, phase three. Now to concentrate on bombing the people themselves into submission and make them cry for mercy. Oh, 
hostile raids then. wasn't much help at night. This was just German bombs against British guts. Hello, Jack. Sound happy enough down there tonight, don't they? Yes, they're all right. The great docks of London were left roaring infernos. Homes were destroyed by incendiaries. Business blocks were aflame. And still the people of London took it. Night after night, they burrowed underground. And morning after morning, they dug themselves out of the wreckage. Good morning, Mrs. Fox. Good morning, Mr. John. See you tonight. Right here. Come on, Betty. Would you like to sit down? Thanks. Boy, Mr. Arn, sleep well? Fine, thanks. Wasn't it a quiet night? What about the one that came down about two? No, I didn't hear it. Did you? No. Oh, we're getting used to them around here. from this for a bit? Of course not. It'd take more than this to get me out of my home. Now go on, you've got to get to work. Okay. The Battle of London was the battle of the people of the city. In spite of bombs and fire and death, they got to their desks and workbenches to spend another 10 or 12 hours working, working, working. The British spirit was stronger than ever. And the RAF was flying higher than ever. Not only higher, but farther. SIO, operation for the night. GP1562, EP781, 10 aircraft. You'll find, I think, a decent photograph of the submarine yards there. Yeah. There's a very good one taken the other night, Monty. Was that? A bit further along. This is the one. That's it. That's, those are the submarine yards. There. Just there. Yes. Well, chaps, this is your target for tonight. It's the submarine and shipbuilding yards at Bremen. It's a vitally important target, and it's got to be hit hard. In the midst of this life and death struggle, the British found strength not only to defend, but to counterattack with what few bombers they could get together.
Goodbye. I'm going in on a glide. I will exact a thousand-fold revenge. All the available German night bombers were put into the air. revenge was Coventry. On the night of November 14th, a million pounds of bombs were dropped on the city. Coventry was smashed as flat as Warsaw and Rotterdam. Coventry dug their loved ones out of the blasted ruins, saw them to their last resting place in a common grave. Hitler could kill them, but damned if he could lick them. They went back to their lathes and machines, for they knew the machine bench was as deadly a weapon as the rifle. And in their hearts was a grim determination that this enemy must be destroyed. That the day was coming when they would strike back. And how they would strike back. Christmas, 1940. Christmas, season of peace on earth, goodwill toward men, was the ironic quiet before Hitler's great burst of rage against a people who couldn't be licked. a 
of mission. So he would burn them to ashes. Millions of firebombs rained down on the great city of London. In a matter of minutes, more than 1,500 different sections of the city burst into roaring flames. Flames that swiftly merged into the greatest fire in recorded history. In the midst of all the fire and destruction, vital water mains were shattered. Water pressure was almost entirely cut off. Heroes of the night were men of the London Fire Brigade who stretched temporary hose lines out to the center of the Thames River, struggling through mud and slime. For the Nazis had carefully picked a night on which the Thames River had one of the lowest ebb tides on record. And while London burned above them, the people of the city held on chin up and thumbs up. They knew this was the people's war and they were the people. And a people that couldn't be panicked, couldn't be beaten. In the months to come, the British were to suffer many such bombings and burnings. But a nation that calls on cold courage when hot courage runs thin may die, but it can't be defeated. not by Hitler. Hitler had lost the battle. He had lost 2,375 German planes and their crews. For the first time, it was the Germans who ate the bitter dirt of defeat. Gone was the legend of their invincibility. For a solid year, the Nazis struck Britain with all their might. They leveled thousands upon thousands of homes, and damaged millions of others. They killed more than 40,000 men, women, and children, and seriously wounded 50,000 more. But not one single Nazi soldier set foot on British soil. But Hitler couldn't stop, and in our next film, we will show how he had to turn to the east again. Why did the Nazis lose the Battle of Britain? First, because a regimented people met an equally determined free people, and the free people made them quit cold. We've been bombed, dive bombed, high level bombed, machine gunned, been through two invasion scares. The last lot we had, we had the house down about our ears. But we're still sticking it, and we're going to stick it. Second, because this was a new kind of war, and the RAF were the men who could fight it. These were the men who belonged to what Hitler called those weak, soft democracies. The British did more than save their country. They won for the world a year of precious time. It was not only for the people of Britain, but for the people of the world that Winston Churchill spoke when he said, Never 
in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few 